you may need to click uh, a few times on the screen to activate your avatar, but then with the arrow keys, you can walk closer to the area to see it better. Uh, you can also, uh, yeah, I see you moving, that's good. You can also use U and E by holding those keys, you can rotate your avatar. What I'm doing right now, I'm pressing on Q and then on E, and you can see me moving. Right, please come to the stage, and we are about to start. I see you here, all of you, fantastic. Okay, well, I would ask our uh, peer audience to um, get excited, because we are here today to learn about inclusive and accessible design. Um, to show you excitement, you can click on the uh, Q, uh, sorry, uh, letter C on your uh, keyboard, and that's a little trick to show love and support and uh, appreciation to our speakers whenever they deliver exciting information. You can also use Y to show thumbs up, and later when we are um, uh, in the networking part, we can also use the keys three, four, four and five, but it's for fun, for something just, you know, um, entertaining. So I will say officially hi. Hello, hello everyone. I'm Eve, founder and CEO Evnus. Evnus is a XR a solution provider. We are based in Amsterdam, in the United States, and covering the whole globe, helping our clients and communities and various individuals to bring their dreams and ideas to life. Whether it's interactive events, uh, virtual learning, upskilling initiatives, or remote teams collaboration, we are super excited to uh, help everyone uh, to achieve their goals and dreams. So here's me in my face, you will see in the video bubble that appear in here, that's how I try to project myself as an avatar, and now you see how I look in, the, in actual life. Um, creation of avatars is a very exciting pro uh, process. Various platforms have inclusion uh, in the stack, in the code, uh, various aspects of how to choose your skin color, how to find a headscarf, or uh, put the clothes that you feel that represents you, some do not. But it's more than just um, creating your avatars. Inclusion and accessibility goes uh, beyond just the uh, preferences of the looks. It is much more than that, and that's what we're going to discuss today in this uh, event. So without any further ado, I would love to give the stage to one and only a very, very inspiring uh, person who is our keynote speaker. It is Jutta Treviranus, who is the director of the Inclusive Design Research Center and professor in the Faculty of Design at Okat University in Toronto. Jutta established the IDRS, uh, the uh, Inclusive Design Research Center, in 1993 as the nexus of a growing global community that proactively works to ensure that our digitally transformed and globally connected society is designed inclusively. So, dear Yuta, please come to the stage, and I would be taking notes myself, because Evnus is building its own solution, and we want to learn from you as well. So please do clap to support. Fantastic, fantastic. Thank you, Eve, and thank you for inviting me. I love that I can be here with this amazing group of women. Um, Eve has been wonderful in showing me the space and how to participate in this event. It's quite a relief from all the Zoom presentations that um, I've been participating in. However, I have a confession to make. Eve asked that I share news of the event with my community and invite some bright, creative young students to help in building this world. I said that I would, 
but on Tuesday, as I was preparing to send the invitation to our community list, I hesitated. You see, my community, the students, my team members, the many partners and colleagues include many community members reliant on alternative access systems. I really love the Respect Gallery. I would love them to see this. However, I tested the environment with a screen reader, a screen magnifier, and a scanning keyboard, and I faced barriers and and more barriers that would mean that um, they couldn't participate. I also considered the bandwidth, the equipment that would be needed and realized that quite a few of the community members um, could not participate. And so I ended up not sending the invitation, which I actually feel quite badly about, but it was because I knew that only certain members in the community could participate and that just didn't seem fair. To be clear, however, the community members that would be left out would likely tell me to send it. They would likely say, don't let, you, let me hold you back. Um, but I decided that they shouldn't be left behind or left back. In fact, I believe that not barreling forward without them, but putting them in front is how we will truly meaningfully go forward. I do want to share the excitement, the excitement of something new, something emergent. I'm old enough that I've been in this field enough that I've participated in this heady phase of creativity more than once with personal computers, with the web, with social media, with smartphones, with artificial intelligence, with sharing platforms, with the cloud, with disintermediated value exchange, with VR, AR, and XR. There is this thrilling moment in time that I love, the moment of possibility, imagination, and unfettered choices. I always imagine that we'll do something truly innovative. This moment is fleeting before the new terrain is claimed by the many forces with predetermined interests serving their established agendas uh, before the conventions set in and imagination is blinkered by what is rather than what could be well before the ideals are sullied and unbounded potential is shackled with conditions i know that is the moment when we have a chance to do something world changing unfortunately we have fallen short, we keep falling short. We have never stayed the course to true, deep, world-altering innovation. There's been a disheartening failure of imagination by the innovators and disruptors. What is sold to us as innovation is simply a new costume on old ideas and mindsets. So you might ask, what do I mean by true innovation? I think it's not just a new fashion, a new trend, or a new way of expressing old things. I don't mean shiny new objects that can do new tricks, a fad that can be monetized for a ridiculous profit. I mean a deep and lasting change that is more than a toy for the elite that can afford it, more than a convenience, more than a new addiction or pastime to compete for our attention. And I'm not saying this to spoil the fun. I love fun. I love to play. I love playing in this environment. I especially like playing with my friends and my loved ones. But that means that we need to create a place where they can participate and enjoy playing. I fear that the innovation field is not really innovating. We're simply creating variations and manifestations of the innovative ideas and mindsets of the 1800s and replicating age-old ethical flaws. We're still convinced that valid humans are normal or average, and if we aren't, we will school you, train you, fix you to be normal. Quantified statistics is a quest to find the average or the norm. Our latest trends are all the devices and apps that give us metrics to track that we are achieving normalcy or to find our way back to what we determine is normalcy. There's no average human. We are all diverse. Our diversity is our strength. 
what we should be seeking is the range of what we call the deviation right now, the amazing spectrum of human differences. We know about the need for diversification from the life sciences, but we think the biggest lesson is survival of the fittest rather than the evolutionary choices that emerge when we relax competitive selection. We think fitness is might, cutthroat competition and power. Um, we forget it is adaptability and symbiosis or collaboration. I worry about all the potentials for innovation we pass up when we fail to collaborate, passing up the, that wonderful alchemy that occurs when diverse great ideas are combined. We're still in the thralls of the 80-20 rule, but we're looking at it backwards if we want innovation, rather than designing for the 80% who take 20% of the effort. We should be designing with the 20% who occupy the unexplored and difficult terrain that will take 80% of the effort, but costs less in the long run and gives us dynamic resilience. Our market research shouldn't try to find the largest customer base. It should find the people who are not served. Most tragically, we th think we need to categorize, sort and label humans, fit them into boxes. Even the diversity, equity and inclusion efforts think this is a good thing to achieve equality. This gives us a score for the balance of power. But uh, equity is more than balancing of power. We need to rethink how we give power and how we use it. So you might ask, what's my bright idea? To find genuine innovation, we need to innovate the process of innovation. First, who we innovate with, who helps us design the process of innovation. Innovation comes from challenges. The people that face the greatest challenges will bring the greatest impetus for innovation. They need to, to frame the problems. I'm not religious, but I think the many forms of the morality tale of the angel, the saint, the prophet, or the god as a beggar in disguise, and the reward to those that treat them with respect and care is apt for innovation. The people that hold the formula and impetus for true innovation are the people who we have excluded and devalued. It isn't the complacent, comfortable, powerful, popular, or wealthy no matter how much they claim the title of innovator. We need to go even deeper though. We need to innovate how we make decisions, not just majority rules or consensus arrived through influence, how we plan, not linear logic models, because life isn't linear. It isn't predictive analytics. Predictive analytics finds the best plan for the past, not the unpredictable future because data is always from the past. We need to innovate how we determine evidence and truth, not statistical significance that only finds truth for the mythical average and is inaccurate or wrong for the margins. We need to innovate how we protect our innovations. But by that, I don't mean intellectual property protection that secures ownership for profit. I mean building in the safeguards so it cannot be abused, misused, or weaponized. So we make it clear that with freedom comes responsibility. For the accessibility community, we need to innovate how we do accessibility. It isn't a checklist for a formula that denies the essence of disability, which is human difference. Equity is not a ritual we perform without any deep reflection. And um, so you might I'd ask, well, what do you propose? Um, and I'm not saying I have the answers. I, I need your help to find these answers. But with my community, I've captured a proposed roadmap for genuine innovation. We call it the three dimensions of inclusive design. And um, Eve, if you can, I, I can't quite see what's up there, but if you can put the next slide up um, that shows the three dimensions. Um, so the first dimension is recognizing that we're all different and we ourselves are the experts in our differences. Nobody else has the expertise to tell somebody that's marginalized that hasn't had 
the participation of research, what they need. Um, this vast range of differences needs to be addressed in an integrated and not a segregated way. And the second dimension is that we need an inclusive process. We need to bring the lar largest diversity of perspectives to the process. It needs to be the individuals with the greatest challenges that help design the process and frame the challenges. And we need to continuously ask, who's missing? Who have we left behind with this innovation? The third dimension is recognizing that we live in a complex adaptive system. We need to seek benefits for everybody. Nothing is done in isolation. We know that everything is entangled and variable. Problems are monocausal. The path out of problems is not linear or formulaic. There's no fixed solution or success. It is a continuous process. But is, it is the people at the margins that are most familiar with these risks and opportunities. And so that's how we're going to find um, benefits for all. And we apply these dimensions in what we call our virtuous tornado. And Eve, if you could show the virtuous tornado. And I, unlike the design thinking squiggle, which iterates to a winning solution, we co-create an adaptable system that stretches to encompass more and more of the missed needs by continuously asking, who are we missing? We appreciate the imperfect, impermanent, and incomplete. And we know that mistakes and failures lead, yield the greatest learning. I trust and hope that this amazing community that's gathered here and this amazing space that you've created um, can lead to and find true innovation. And thank you for having me here. And I'm going to turn it back over to Eve. All right, everyone, please do click on C. This is, well, I got goosebumps. Uh, topics addressed, the points addressed, it is exactly what people need to hear. It is exactly what we are concerned about. Building with the speed of life, uh, light, sorry, and life as well, not realizing what we're building, how we're building, how we are not even, not including, but leaving people behind. And this is what bothers me for so long already, where we are constantly talking and talking and talking, but we do not take notes. We do not put it to practice. And uh, Yuta and I had this chat before the event where she said, like, okay, so what happened for the, uh, during the last 20 years when so many things for accessibility have been designed, have been developed, and they are not visible. Metaverse is growing, the metaverse is coming, NFTs are everywhere, but at the same time, we're doing exactly what we did before with dot-com type of scenario, you know, which is rushing, and it's not healthy, it is not needed to do so. Now, I would like to continue this discussion because I personally find it's so dang important for people to hear, and there is no one else to invite us the, uh, the expert on the topic about ethical design that is not only UX, but algorithmic, for algorithmic justice, AI that is ethical and inclusive. Person who is one of my role models inspires me to the goosebumps. You can maybe not see it in my video, but I would love to call to the stage Elizabeth Adams, affiliate fellow at Stanford University of Human Centered Artificial Intelligence and Chief AI Ethics at Women in AI, as well as just a very incredible uh, individual who really tries to make a difference, uh, helping many companies and people to become more ethical, more inclusive in their initiatives that they do. All right. Thank you, Elizabeth. You're here next to me. I will upload to you as well. Please take this stage and I will disappear on the main stage. Eve. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Yuta. What an amazing event so far. I will tell you one of the things that I do like about the metaverse is that I don't have to use my camera. And we're talking about inclusive and accessible design. And as an African-American woman who uses Zoom and Google Meet quite often, the default cameras do not pick up 
the shade of my skin tone. Therefore, I need to use a ring, a ring light. And imagine eight to 10 hours of meetings with a ring light. So I'm excited today that I don't have to. And hopefully that my picture will show, um, give everyone an idea of what I look like. So Eve, again, thank you so much for the invitation to host and to moderate today in this metaverse environment that you've created. I'm very excited to share the stage with an expert panel in the discussion around inclusive and accessible design. But before I introduce them, let's think again about why we're here. Advances in artificial intelligence, extended reality, robotics, and wearable computing are creating novel technological opportunities. And as technology continues to advance into society, into government and academia at such a rapid pace, we must ensure that this awesome technology and the new ways that we interact with it is equitable, that it's fair, that it's inclusive and accessible. And each of our guests is an expert in inclusive and accessible design. And I think it's time to hear from them. So let's get started. I'd like to invite each guest up to the stage. And as I call your name, please join me. Um, we'll get a chance to hear from these brilliant minds as I ask them to share a little bit about themselves. All right, so I'm facing you. I'd like to invite Yuta and Valerie to stand to the right side of me. And I'd also like to invite Kelly and Marion to stand to the left side of me and to face the audience. Wonderful. Here we are. Um, awesome. So look, let's get this kicked off. And I'm going to ask, starting with Yuta, we've, we've heard from Yuta, but if you could tell us a little bit more about yourself and just ask that you each take about a minute and a half to introduce yourselves and also talk about where you're located. We'll start with Yuta, we'll go to Valerie, and then we will go to Kelly and then Marianne. Thank you, Elizabeth. And I'm um, the director of something called the Inclusive Design Research Center, and I'm also a professor at OCAD University, which is in Toronto, Canada. Um, and uh, I'd like to acknowledge that um, I'm privileged to be part of this amazing, amazing community, uh, not only of students, but of community members who are huge hugely different and what our um, determination is to make sure that we proactively engage in emerging systems and practices and make sure that they are inclusive right from the start and i'll uh, because i've already taken so much time i'll turn it over to others to take um, additional time thank you so much valerie Please introduce yourself and tell us where you're located. Hey everyone, I'm, I'm Valerie. I'm uh, located in Los Angeles. Uh, I'm the CTO of a story file. Uh, we're a tech startup that's trying to use conversational video to basically help people connect uh, in all sorts of places, have conversations with people that they wouldn't usually get to meet. Um, the idea is anyone can record their story using their webcam or, and then basically turn that into an interactive video where anyone can come up and ask questions uh, and we'll find the best story that the person uh, has talked about and um, basically have a conversation. So we've been doing interviews with Holocaust survivors, with historical figures, um, and we've uh, released an application called Story for Life where you could record your grandparents and ask them about their, how, their wedding, how they got married, and you could pass that on as like a living interactive video to your kids and your grandkids. Thank you so much. And Kelly, tell us uh, about yourself and where you're located. Hi, I'm Kelly Vero from NFT Consult. I'm the co-founder of an NFT consultancy business at the moment, but I have 30 years of game development experience where I've been a, a game designer, predominantly charged with bringing more diversity into video video games or onto hardware platforms. So my entire career has been focused around this, where we are right now, 
So it feels really, really wonderful to be living in the metaverse because I've been dreaming of it for the last sort of 30 years, a place to bring everybody together. I'm located in Zurich in Switzerland, but you can probably tell by my accent that I'm originally from the UK, where I spent, spent most of my formative and career years working with a variety of incredible game industry notable figures, as well as um, studios, but note that they are mostly male dominated. So I've been living very much like everybody else on this panel in a very male dominated environment for the last millions of years, it feels like. So this is very, very liberating. Thanks for having me. That is wonderful. Thank you. Miriam, please tell us uh, a little bit about yourself and where you're from. Hello, everyone. And I feel like I'm on Eurovision. Now, hi from, from Amsterdam. Um, I'm based in, in Amsterdam. I am Dutch, uh, although my accent might be a bit uh, British because I'm now hearing um, or mix of British and American because of the international voices. Um, my background is, is a combination of uh, digital. I've been working in the digital space as an independent professional for the last 10 years, but I've actually worked in in between business and IT, uh, doing something digital for the last 20 years. So um, I'm just, you know, ageism is immediately coming in. Uh, I'm 50 years old, um, call it uh, out myself as that. Uh, I am also identifying as a lesbian woman and my pronouns are she, her, although I um, lean towards some non-binary conversations as well. Um, so as you can see, <laughs> um, not just a uh, uh, um, not just digital, my other uh, big uh, big passions or, you know, really my life is about uh, the LGBTIQ plus community. I am the co-founder of an organization called Work Play, Workplace Pride, uh, uh, which focuses on being yourself at work. Um, I've actually resigned from the board after 16 years uh, last year, but I am now the chair of the largest um, LGBTIQ plus media platform in the Netherlands, which is called Gay Grant. Um, although the name gay might imply that it's only for, um, for homosexual men, it's for uh, the widest community. And we have influence also on um, policy in the Netherlands. So very passionate about that. And from a um, AI and, um, uh, and, and metaverse uh, point of view, I, um, I have been working on conversational AI for the last five years, doing um, chatbots and voice projects. And that also brought me to uh, having a strong opinion about gender-free technology um, and basically saying not gender neutral, but gender free, as in the freedom to be whoever you are from a gender point of view, and also making sure that all the technology that we have isn't uh, unnecessarily creating bias based on gender. And, um, so I'm not against using gender where relevant, because for example, in the healthcare situation, it's quite important to know what your body is because your hormones have an impact. Uh, but it's making sure that we understand gender from that point of view. Um, and so I give talks also on gender-free technology and uh, very, very proud to be here. And or, or, um, maybe not the word proud, <laughs> very, very um, happy to be here um, and humbled by uh, the great names I'm um, with in the, on this stage. And um, I'm realizing I've been speaking Dutch all day. So um, going back into English, I, ha I notice I have a little bit of trouble uh, translating. So bear with me on the on the language front uh, front for today. But thank you for 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 letting me me be on this stage. Thank you all. Can we give our expert panelists a round of applause here? Oops, so sorry, so sorry. I have no idea what uh, I just did. I'm learning about the metaverse myself. It looks epic. No worries. <laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm trying to get back here. All right. Let me turn myself around here and look at you all. Okay. All right. Can everyone see me? Let me take a step back. Excuse me, Valerie. Don't mean to get in your space. I'll do we can see okay. Well. All right. Here, let's go ahead and get started. We've heard some introductions from this expert panel. So here we go. So AI and frontier technologies have the potential to make virtual spaces more inclusive and remove many accessibility barriers. For example, computer vision may help blind people better 
sense the visual world. And speech recognition and translation technologies may provide real-time captioning for people who are hearing impaired. And new robotic systems, including VR suits, may augment the capabilities of people with limited mobility. However, ethical concerns such as inclusion, prejudice, privacy, social acceptability, and human behavior must be addressed. And we heard about some of those in Utah's speech earlier. But let's start with defining what each of these panelists believe inclusive and accessible technology truly is. And could you give us an example of what this technology solution might look like? And we'll start with Yuda, and we'll go um, to Valerie and then Kay and Marion. Okay, yeah, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, let me tell you about my moments of unfettered imagined potential. In the early days of VR, and I've been in VR, uh, I guess what you would call the first wave of VR, um, we saw VR as a way to translate what was not possible into the possible, like many of you here, uh, to create worlds that reached to the, the, those unexplored edges of our human differences. And what I showed earlier was what we call the um, human starburst, where the outliers and the minorities are out in, in that unexplored domain. Um, we created orchestras and bands where anyone could play an instrument, even if they had only a single movement they could control, even if they listened through vibration and images, even if they saw through sound and touch, and even if they read through pictures and understood and learned through actions. Um, I, I'll give you one example that sticks in my mind, and this was in the 90s. Um, and what we were doing was trying to reimagine a grade four geography text. Uh, the, the challenge was that if you couldn't see, then you couldn't use a grade four geography text. And the only solutions at the time were these tactile graphics, which um, created uh, feelable versions of all of the pages of a geography text, but in order to communicate it, it would take up an entire room. And what we tried to use was a multimodal palette. The palette included 3D real-world sounds, speech, 3D visual renderings, 3D haptic artifacts for all the elements of maps. The students could travel the map, feel the terrain as they approached a point of interest. A city, for example, they would feel a gravity well and the city noises would get louder. The city would be represented as a haptic artifact that, rep that signaled that it was a city. And, and when you arrived on the city or in the city, it would speak its name. You could query it about all sorts of things, uh, the population, the, the um, what you could find there, et cetera. You could zoom in and explore the streets and the buildings. And um, with respect to the geography text, we expressed latitude and longitude lines like elastics. You could feel the direction of a river as you went over it. And if you wanted to feel borders, you could extrude the bounded things like a province or a state or a country and feel around the edges and walk those edges. Of course, every student wanted to use it. Um, and we want to create the next iteration now that the technology is more affordable and our bandwidth is better. But that's um, one of the, well, that in terms of examples, that was the example of our trials that I think most expressed that process of the virtuous tornado, tornado where we kept bringing in more and more individuals to help us figure out how that those many diverse perspectives could be included. Buddha, that is actually brilliant. Thank you for sharing that example. Um, Valerie, can you tell us some more um, on what you believe um, inclusion and accessibility is and share some examples with us as well? Thank you, Elizabeth. Yeah, so I mean, part of the core mission of our, my company is the idea that every story matters. I mean, I mean, like everyone should be able to record and share their stories everywhere. And that's really challenging. I mean, for the, a lot of the reasons that were brought up earlier about like, accessibility and um, a lot of the biases and like 
things we sort of take for granted. Um, I, our main, one of our main goals was that like, you should be able to create an AI avatar or AI agent without having to have a degree in computer science. Um, the, if, you ha if you have a web camera, you should be able to create an AI and, and tell your story. Um, but that, even that has certain assumptions. It's saying like, well, everyone has access to tech. They know how to turn on their camera and their microphone. And even though we've just gone through this pandemic and everyone's learned to do this, it's something that we often still struggle with. Um, I know even like today, I was like, how do I get my camera working with um, the metaverse? Um, so there are a few things that, um, to, that have sort of inspired me. Um, I mean, one is really trying to enable different methods of input. I mean, whether it's having voice input so you can ask questions and have the AI recognize what you're saying, text access, and making sure you have good subtitles on the video, uh, on all the media that you present. Um, I think the next step is going to be really looking at nonverbal communication. So having cameras that look at you and can recognize sign language. And we're just starting to see those sort of algorithms that can detect that kind of, those, those kind of gestures you're in, using neural networks. Um, but then even within like ASR and speech recognition, we see that that's really biased based on what data is available. It tends to be biased towards English and certain ages certain genders, certain accents. Um, but there's, there has been some work out there that we've seen where people are crowdsourcing more voice data. Um, one of the ones that inspired me was um, the Digital Umaganda project, which was working with Mozilla Common Voice Foundation to capture um, examples of languages in Africa. Um, and they went out and I think they captured, so about two years ago, about over 1,200 hours of um, voices and training data in, in Rwanda. Um, and obviously, Africa is a place where if you look at the languages supported by Google ASR, there's a big giant gap of this entire continent where there's very little training data. Um, but by crowdsourcing that, they were able to, now it's one of the fastest growing languages within that data set. Um, and they released, I think, a chatbot that uh, provided information about COVID um, in their native languages. Um, We've been doing some similar work. Uh, we're starting to talk to Cherokee tribes in Oklahoma about how do we sort of record and capture these sort of endangered languages um, and using sort of training the youth of the tribe to sort of capture their elders and capture those stories while they, while they can. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of work that can be done, particularly by crowdsourcing the technology so that everyone can sort of contribute in their own way. Um, so ultimately, like the story is what matters in the technology with getting in the way of that. So thank you. That is incredible. Kelly? Please share your ideas of inclusive and accessible technology, what you think, some examples. Feel free to share with us. Listen, technology is really simple because it has to be native to us. If it doesn't feel like it's a part of us, then it's a waste of any application, metaverse, platform, tools, technology that you build. I always work with businesses at a point where they sort of say, hey, we've got no users to our platform. Why aren't people coming here? We have the best idea ever. Why don't people want to come? We've put in all of this accessibility. We've put in all of this like great uh, discoverability, inclusion focus, et cetera but they forgot to onboard their users. They forgot to make their users feel like they're part of the experience. So it doesn't matter how much we throw at a piece of technology, unless it passes the mom test, for example, it's really not gonna go very far. And you've lost a lot of money as a business. And it's my job to make sure that you don't do that. So I try to follow those sort of principles from technology a little bit like um, Marion said earlier sort of at the beginning uh, where we're a little bit older in generationally I think it's important to carry that technology with you but not necessarily the ideals that go with it because we always wanted to be in a place now we're in this place how are we going to fix some of the problems that are legacy how are we going to get rid of a lot of that stuff and I 
I look around and see that interoperability is one of the biggest problems that we have in order to have full access natively to applications, regardless of who we are and whatever it is that we're bringing to the party. That's very personal to us. So we have to be quite respectful of it if we're creating that stuff. And I find, actually, this is probably the most ridiculous example that I'm going to give. But things like Fitbit are really, really easy to access. They're really super and provided that we don't fall into a rabbit hole of data and how data is managed, we can onboard into Fitbit very, very easily by having a wearable. And with that wearable, we can access data from everything from our computer to our phone. So I think that the interoperability is a great example of the direction of travel that we should be going in in terms of inclusivity. And we should probably swallow up interoperability into the diversity and inclusion discussion generally. Thank you so much. For that. I love that example. I actually have a wearable. I actually enjoy the nudging that it gives me to get up and work, walk around. And that's the kind of nudging that I think I can uh, approve of. Uh, Miriam, tell us what inclusive and accessible design means to you and share an example. OK, well, it's uh, you already had so many great examples that made me think you know what am i going to share um i also don't know too much about examples in the metaverse yet so um but for me it comes down to um, user experience um and making it really easy for everyone so taking away the hurdles and um i work in healthcare now so i work for uh, the communications department or the online department of, of a hospital in the netherlands and um, one of the things we did uh, about four years ago was introducing a chatbot. So we changed the homepage of the website into a conversational interface. Um, and one of the biggest learnings for me was all the assumptions that we had, that on the one hand, uh, all the medical staff and all the colleagues were saying, well, but the elderly people won't understand what you're doing. Um, and at the same time, I also realized when we were doing user tests with, uh, with good UX, that it was the actual elderly people who, who were easily clicking through things and said, oh, this is handy. I can I just get an answer to my question. And they weren't thinking about the technology at all. They didn't know it was a chatbot. Um, and they just saw that they had a quite that they can click on a big shiny button and then uh, magically the answer came. That, that for me was the biggest learning uh, from, from a technology point of view uh, when entering any cool new tool because uh, I'm, I'm like you know a gadget freak i love all of this new stuff i love the metaphors i love ai but i also um, live in a reality where um, today the majority of my meetings were in teams and i had to explain to colleagues that you can actually use the chat function in there and they hadn't, hadn't actually seen that before and i said jesus i'm I don't, i'm going to pre present tonight uh, maybe i should do jesus oh, oh golly i'm presenting tonight in a metaverse environment um, I'm dealing with people who don't even know how to use uh, a regular uh, technology that we think is, you know, um, old school. So for me, the biggest learning about accessible um, technology and accessible design is, is not, not designing or developing for the technology, but actually looking, what is the problem we're trying to solve? Um, and is this really the best way uh, to do it? And uh, maybe two post-its uh, on, a, on a wall will do better than creating a whole metaverse yeah, just to throw it out there um another really nice example i do know though from a conversational ai is project silver in the netherlands and that's a project again working with elderly people where they are using um, things like a google home to battle um, uh, loneliness and, and actually help elderly people to talk to something and they feel less lonely so, so again, it's the technology itself isn't really the thing. It's it's the fact that you can talk to something and it talks back to you and it's, it serves a purpose. Um, and the same kind of realm is um, all the solutions where for Alzheimer or people with dementia, um, they have this flower pot that, that looks like a face that talks to you. Um, and at the same time, there's the technology where, where they put a couple of um, all these things, cameras in, in people's houses and, and, and based and having some smart technology and based on that they can actually see something's wrong with someone's habits so uh, they don't eat in, uh, well anymore because you know the the, the fridge door hasn't been opened for uh, two, two days and things like that would then give a signal to a medical staff um, 
and they will actually check up on you and say, you know, is everything going well? So they're doing really smart things that aren't intrusive um, that make people's lives better. So for me, accessibility is is using technology to solve a problem. Um, and, um, and, and as basic as, as that, and actually real life problems. Yeah, let me stop at that because uh, I, otherwise I'll just rant on for a couple of other examples. But uh, yeah, that, that for me, it really is about solving problems. Thank you. Thank you so very much. And I do want to mention that Yuda has to leave our space a little early. So if you see her exit, you see Yuda exit, excuse me. Um, I just want to make sure that you're aware of that. So we talked a little bit about design. I, I know that Miriam. Yes. Excuse me. Jutta, uh, I hope you'll be okay if our participants have questions to you and they will post it on our LinkedIn, for example, Twitter, and then I will direct, uh, redirect them to you for the answers in the future. Yeah, thank you. And apologies that I, I need to leave. This is because it's of the day it is. I've got a whole bunch of talks. So yes, please do reach out to me on Twitter or uh, LinkedIn and even email if you want. Thank you okay. so much. Thank you so everyone. much. Thank, thank you for sharing. Today. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. So we've talked a little bit, um, talked somewhat about inclusion and accessible technology. And now let's talk about uh, design. Uh, let's talk about the solutions that we're designing, the tech solutions. But before we get there, according to the World Health Organization, more than 1 billion people worldwide I have disabilities. The United Nations High Commissioner for Refugee Data, that doesn't include members um, associated with the war in Ukraine, estimates that a global number of people forcibly displaced from their homes is now at 84 million, and over 26.6 million are refugees. Also, 3.6% of the global population are international immigrants. The SOS survey speaks of about 5.6 of U.S. adults, similar to the number in Europe, identifying as LGBTQ. We see a continued upward trajectory propelled by a younger generation staking out its presence in this world. But structural and public discrimination and violence is nothing new to all of the mentioned groups also to women and children, and especially in the digital world. For example, women, women of color are more impacted by violence online and through digital means than white women, with black women being 84% more likely to, re to receive abusive tweets on, on Twitter. Moreover, virtual reality, one of the key aspects of the metaverse, has already been integrated into a porn industry. The software behind most VR headsets is open source, and as a result of this, there are a lot of sex games with the VR space. For instance, there are sex games on Second Life and the Sandbox Metaverse, which allow men to fantasize with female avatars. So we should realize and think through the design of each of these technologies that we're building, as we've heard before. So therefore, the question that I pose to all, and we'll start with Marion, is how can the builders of cre and creators ensure that AI and virtual environments are trustworthy, safe, and accessible by design. Well, um, for for me, uh, design is about about this. For, for me, this is about two sides: the technology side and the human level. So, um, when we look at um, uh, the technology side of, of building new solutions, uh, and it's, of course, it's about uh, um, it's it's about security. Is it is it safe at all? Full stop. So. Are there any are there any data leaks possible? Um, uh, are they selling the data? And to start to start on that particular uh, point, um, I've already identified as, as lesbian. Um, now, in a number of countries in the world, and that's actually shocking around, that is illegal, um, including you know death penalty uh, uh, judgments on it. So if I go to one of those places and my data is then sold, uh, I, I don't think I want to go back into, I don't want to go to Saudi Arabia because instead of going into the country, I will go directly to jail or worse. Um, and it's things like that that we have to be very mindful of that um, if you build technology, um, of course, you have your, your fundamental uh, security and safety things that the, the, the tech folks will look at, but it's also that kind of safety. And that also brings me to the safe space side of it. Safe space to me is how, you know, is the human factor of it. How do we create safe spaces? How do I feel safe to identify 
um because i'm i'm feeling very vulnerable but at the same time very strong about being out here because i think if you google me by now it's it's pretty obvious uh, how i identify but i'm you know an exception to the rule uh, in the last part of the world um and so, so uh, for me it's always important to check out the safe spaces uh from you know can i be myself um and it's mostly that we find the signals for it not being safe um are people only talking about uh, about their husbands are they, uh, and and wives are they um only white uh, all of these particular things that you will probably self-center and say well let's maybe not you know be my full self here I'll, i'm going to check it out for a while before i actually uh, be be my full self here um from a design point of view it comes back to um, basic design principles and basic design uh, ways of working so um, you do your user research and not just with one particular uh, group as you um, very very well explained it in the starting point um, it's also about user testing and testing it with a wide variety of people and specifically with that 20 percent who are the regular people or you know we're all regular people or however you frame that um, but who are not perceived as the norm and making sure that they are included. Um, it's about the accessibility guidelines that were already come, uh, already discussed, but it's also about access because um, we are talking about the metaverse, but when COVID hit, uh, we realized, and this is an example from the Netherlands, is that how many children who are going to school do not have a computer at home? and all of a sudden could not have access to lessons because they couldn't um, well, well, couldn't work from home or couldn't have home tutoring. It's that fundamental uh, part that poverty also means that you do not have a uh, access to the internet. So if everything is now online and that's the only way to get to things, that implies you have a phone, it implies you have a computer, it implies you have Wi-Fi, it implies you have access. Um, I used to think, well, that, you know, this happens in Africa. But really, I, that happened in Amsterdam, uh, where that's that, like the highest density of, of Wi-Fi. But there's quite a large uh, part of the population we now realize does not have access to the Internet. It's also about language, uh, not just speaking, having English as your first language or your second language. It's also about what they, at least in the Netherlands, call B1 language. So it's, it's simple language and not super academic and using terms that other people don't understand. Um, and there's also a lot of people who don't can't even read. Um, so making sure that they are, are not, you know, perceived to use a text only uh, interaction. It's all of these these things that we need to be uh, mindful of. Um, so it helps to have a diverse team, obviously. You know, it's like stating the obvious. But when you start with a diverse team, you have all of these people involved. And if they're not in your team, you can hire them externally. Um, then build uh, all the solutions and then start testing it. And you know. Even if you've done it with the right team, with the right people um, and with the right intentions, accidents will happen. So it's really looking for the side effects or the bycatch. So you might have had the, the, the brilliant solution to, to actually solve a problem. You've done that. But in the process, um, something else happened that wasn't uh, supposed to happen. And that is what you need to look for, I think, when you talk about, uh, for me at least, uh, for inclusive design and inclusive development. Let me stop Thank there. Oh, time for other people to add to that. <laughs> thank you. No, and, and next, before we go to Valerie to ask the same question, thank you for that uh, uh, powerful synopsis of your lens and perspective. It's so important, especially as. Elizabeth, I think we lost you for a second. We can hear you. Thank you. Thank you. So I was asking Valerie, Valerie, what is your perspective around AI and virtual environments and being trustworthy, safe, and accessible by design? Yeah, so, I mean, the idea of, I mean, particularly trust and authenticity is something that, I mean, I've been giving a lot of thought to because I mean, we're in the sort of trying to build human relationships. And I see a lot of these virtual platforms, I mean, they, they imagine as much as they allow us to connect, allow us to interact with each other. I mean, both in the virtual world and then building real world relationships. So, I mean, how do we validate and so balance the sort of authenticity with the ability for people to express themselves? Like, I mean, so, I mean, personally, so like I identify as like, I'm transgender, non-binary, 
so like being able to control my appearance here and control my avatar is really important to me. It was part of my like authentic expression. But uh, I mean, I, was, I mean, that is that that how how do you like balance that sort of thing, authenticity, with sort of like how do you with sort of trust? And really, it's about people being able to control their how their story is being told. So I mean, a key part of design is that everything is sort of privacy by default. People should be only sharing the stories with the people that they they want. But you also want to make, make it easy. So um, one of the things that I mean, one of the projects we've been um, working with is with a, a nonprofit in um, Arizona called Paint for a Cure, and they're, they're basically trying to record the stories of ALS survivors. So in their case. Um, how they present themselves is actually really challenging because they're losing their ability to have motor skills, they're losing their ability to speak, but they really want to make sure their voices are being heard. So giving them access to digitally synthesized voices, uh, making them be able to control their appearance um, is a, a big part of that, that, that project. Um, but as you, as you start, as the sort of digital synthesized voices, digital synthesized videos are sort of expanding, we're getting to the area of deep fakes and how do we actually even authenticate that that video is what we say it is. Um, this is a lot of the work we started doing was um, interviewing Holocaust survivors with the USC Shoah Foundation and New Dimensions and Testimony. And in the, that case with Holocaust survivors, it was really, really important to authenticate that this was real video of these people telling the stories. This wasn't a deep fake. This wasn't something that was synthesized. So um, I think the thing that is starting to come out right now, which, I, which I'm excited about, is we're starting to get these protocols for validating, is this video fake? Or what what um, processing has been applied to this video? So uh, this is there's this uh, correlation called the Coalition for Content Providence and Authenticity, which is a coalition of companies including Microsoft, Intel, Adobe, BBC, um, and they're sort of setting these standards for how do we watermark all our media content to say this is where it came from, um, this is what's happening to it. So now if you go into Adobe Photoshop, you can actually save our images and say these filters were applied to it. So you know exactly where it's come from and where it's been manipulated. And so hopefully we'll get more and more platforms sort of implementing those standards so we can actually see that you can click on the icon in the corner and it says this is this is is, it, is this true or has this been manipulated in some way? And people need to be able to manipulate the data because that's part of their expression, it's part of controlling their um, appearance, but we just need to be able to document that. Um, another example of this uh, is a project that we're working on um, actually in Ukraine where we're trying to record interviews with um, refugees and with people in that area. And that's really challenging in itself because I mean, when you're trying to hunker down in a basement and there are bombs going off, Usually using new technology is down like at the bottom of your list below food, shelter, and just sort of staying alive. Um, and we're trying to record these stories, but also and, and authenticate that, yes, this person recorded it on this phone in this place. But if that story gets in the wrong hands, then maybe we're putting those people at risk because now they might be a target of some retaliatory like, attack. Um, so in that case, we're using um, a project uh, called uh, a group called Starling Labs, which is at USC and um, Stanford, and they've built a really exciting new pipeline for using decentralized blockchain to both store data, um, ingesting it on a mobile phone, and then audit and verify where it came from. So again, I think decentralizing a lot of these technologies um, is sort of the way that we're going to be able to protect people and make sure that everything is authentic and trustworthy. Thank you so much Ray, for sharing all of those examples of the ways the story file is moving forward with a trustworthy environment, virtual environment that's safe and accessible. Kelly, can do you mind sharing with us what your vision and uh, perspective is of a virtual environment that's trustworthy and safe and accessible by design? Um, I think that a lot of uh, current virtual environments are quite difficult. In your opening or proceeding uh, opener about this, this subject particularly, my eyebrows raised when you talked about VR porn, which I thought was quite funny. I work quite closely with femtech and sex tech to use things like GPT-3 engines to create things like AI partners. 
we have a golden rule in the games industry where we've been very, very fortunate over the last 30, 40 years to create some of the things that we now take for granted. And one of those mottos that we have in our industry is if the sex industry takes our technology, we've won. So if you start to see things like games that are sex based or VR chat that has questionable or maybe for some people interactions that's a sign of great technology whether it's open or not it still provides a good success ratio of whether your tech works or not so that's a really good rule of thumb to start with and it's something definitely that femtech and sex tech have started to take into what it is that they're creating moving forwards i think that virtual platforms generally come with caution so I work quite a lot with children's applications and we have fortunately a lot of great regulatory bodies that allow us to really just check and have a sanity check about what it is that we're creating from a design perspective. My feeling is that a lot of these new platforms and a lot of virtual experiences are pretty elitist. They're not really appealing to the population en masse. They're appealing to a small percentage of a population, which may be the haves, and there's not a lot for the have-nots. I really want to work in a world where um, virtual platforms, games, tools, technology is accessible for everybody. And the way that we have to do that is, again, we've got to go back to the starting point. In the games industry, we have 60 seconds for mobile games and five minutes to 20 minutes for console games for us to make an impact and a difference. If people haven't bought in within that time frame, we're done. So if you have to deploy every single thing in your toolkit to make it work, then you, you've got a real hard job ahead of you. But if you understand your audience and you're clear that you want to create something that is for everybody, then you've got to figure out quite quickly which tools you're going to deploy in your toolkit to make that happen. Now, for me, in my day to day, that's everything from creating AI partners for, for um, uh, sex tech um, all the way to uh, and that's with Dildonics, etc., all the way to working with children's virtual products and adhering to copper regulation. So I'm pretty open. And I think if human beings generally are pretty open, then the technology will both be open and centralized, depending on what it is that we require. In an ideal world, I'd love to see everything decentralized. But the reality is not every country, as Marion described and as Valerie has said, not every country is prepared to be as open with its technology quota and the design offering that is available for its community and its culture. I think all of you all just said amazing word right there. I mean, so much to take in and explore. And as I was thinking about everything that you all was saying, I was thinking about my own research in my doctoral program. And I recently completed a human subject research certification. And it made me realize that maybe if we all took a, a similar certification and before we started designing AI, and in this certification, although it's about research, designing research, it really gives you a great understanding of privacy, who might be considered vulnerable, why they might be considered vulnerable, how we should, or specifically how this, my research design should take into consideration for all of these things. And everything that you all are saying here today makes me think about that, but also I'm quite excited about the work that you're doing because I do see that there's going to be um, a better future with you all leading it. But let's pivot to another question here. So on January 15th of 2021, the Dutch government resigned just two months ahead of the general elections. And the reason was because of a scandal in which thousands of Dutch families, many of them ethnic minorities, were wrongly accused of child welfare fraud. The scandal is just one example of the increasing evidence that AI and machine learning have an impact on society and humans that's less beneficial. Other examples include facial recognition software and the discriminations against darker skinned faces and the faces of women. 
image generation algorithms and autocomplete cropped images of women with low of women with low top uh, cut top bikinis or the state of the art language models GPT-3 that has explicit tendencies to link Muslims to violence. The data sets that the solutions are based on often skewed in ways that reinforce existing inequalities. I don't know if some of you saw in Yahoo yesterday, there was a, um, um, an advertisement, not an advertisement, but a news uh, feature that said that there is a monkey disease or something like that. I can't remember what it was. And it immediately had a darker skinned person with the, with the disease. But it was found in the U.S. in, um, I believe it was Massachusetts. And that was just something that made me think about the associations and the connections and how data is annotated all the way um, at the beginning of the life cycle of an algorithm. But I'm going to ask Kelly to take this next question. We just heard about all of that. So how will this work in the universe? How can we use AI and how can it be used and um, so that we, so that the associated risks are minimized. What do you guys think about that? I'm really concerned. Um, and uh, I guess one of the reasons why I'm concerned is because earlier this year, Roblox decided that they were going to use facial recognition for children to access Roblox. And this makes me really nervous because because the way that the picture is being painted is, yeah, it's really cool that, you know, you can show your face in front of a camera and it will be read and you will be able to be inserted directly into the Roblox kind of space of your choice. But the truth of the fact is faces equal data and where there is data, there is danger. And especially where there is data that has been generated for people under the age of 13, it's a real no go. And it makes me very, very nervous nervous about how that information is both going to be collected and how it's going to be disseminated and distributed. I think from the perspective of um, fake news, I think that, you know, imagery can be manipulated really, really easily. I think in the metaverse, we're looking to be able to find our people. So whomever those people are, we have to give quite an, a percentage of trust in ourselves to what it is that we're doing inside the metaverse. Remember that most of the metaverse is decentralized. So that information that you put across there is open to everybody. It really is a, a massive food fight. And my big sort of concern is where there are vulnerable adults and children that are participating in adult conversations or having relationships in areas with which they are both unsure and do not feel safe, that there is no safety for those people. Additionally, again, going back to what I said before, I'm really, really worried about the fact that there is not enough real access to the metaverse that there should be for people of colour, for people who come from vulnerable um, backgrounds, from the poverty gap. We're really just not servicing people the way that we should be servicing them within the metaverse. And we will continue to not do that whilst gigantic tech corporations are controlling every sort of element of what it is that we're doing. But let's not forget what AI and ML actually is really. And machine learning asks questions. So if you ask the right questions of your end user, then AI will create the correct answers. So it's the human error that's causing a great deal of what it is that we're suffering with it here. And it's rather an oroboro because this snake is eating its own tail constantly until we stop. And as you said, have some kind of regulatory practice in, that is beyond the Asimov, you know, Xerof rules of cybernetics and really get quite real about what it is that we want to do with regards to AI and ML. That is powerful. I feel like I feel like I'm in church. Um, Marion, what are your thoughts on how we can address this in the metaverse? And then Valerie, I'm going to have uh, go to a separate question for you, Marion. Yeah, I think well, everything um, what has been said, you know, I couldn't have said it better. Um, for, for me, it's about you know, exactly the human error and the bias that we have, which is humanly. Um, you know, that's just. Part of it as part of, uh, of what, what makes us human is we have to make so many decisions by day that that's how our brains work. But at the same time, um, that's if, if, if you have a non-diverse group to develop things or design it uh, or create the data set, 
you don't see the flaws and then you get built-in discrimination rather than just accidental discrimination and it gets amplified and it's as simple as that um Instead of looking at, at, at race and gender, what are, are the usual, uh, sorry, that are um, issues, it's, it's something simple as have a Google and say, and type in the term uh, entrepreneur and see what it looks like. You'll see uh, a white guy in his 30s uh, with a certain way of dressing. Um, and that's what an entrepreneur apparently is according to our common standards. So um, apparently I am not an entrepreneur. It's even those simple things is that that is so much things if you just Google search at the moment with the images to see what is currently perceived as you see how much uh, is wrong with the current data. Um, I have actually been in front of um, facial recognition software um, and it just sort of misclassifies me uh, both on age and gender. Um, so some of it makes me younger, which I'm very happy about, at least at the moment, at least. But uh, being misgendered, um, you know, it's a nuisance. But if that then starts to be the base of um, conclusions that are being drawn, um, that's that's bad. Now, in most cases, being classified as a man is actually creating new uh, new privileges for you. Uh, but still, it's not right. And it, it's these kind of concepts that I think we have to worry about mostly is people who create these things aren't aware about the bias and they say well but it's it's ai it's technology it can't be wrong um it's it, but the input's wrong on so many levels and um i think a lot of you have already seen coded bias which is on netflix um, have a look at that and see what can go wrong if the cameras don't uh, recognize you and elizabeth you already mentioned that about your your zoom camera not being recognizing you um, and this just gets way worse if then you know, conclusions are drawn from it. But it's also about, you know, if you start using compute, uh, um, image rec sorry, facial recognition to open buildings, which sounds like fun, um, then also all of a sudden the landlord of your housing um, complex starts to know more about your behavior. Is that the kind of thing we want? And that's, you know, outside of the metaverse, the conversations we need to have. So I uh, hopefully that if we are entering the metaverse and we're designing it, we're not making the same mistakes, but at the moment, slightly concerned about it. Let's put it uh, mildly. Thank you for that. I, I will say that I think environments and, and events like this are so important. When I first dipped into the metaverse a couple of years ago, I went in and I was in a, in a predominantly um, all white environment and no one really spoke to me. So I jumped back out and I changed my avatar to a white guy. And all of a sudden, I had all of this interaction, which I thought was very interesting. So these types of experiences to discuss this and what this means for people, especially people who don't have a voice, those that we are here advocating for, I think it's so important. So kudos again to Evenus and Eve for hosting this. Um, Valerie, let's switch gears a little bit. Uh, you mentioned that you are the policy technology officer at a very innovative company, StoryFile, that's developed engaging video solutions. One um, is Conversa, which powers conversational video, um, AI, storytelling as a story file, and your website, as well as um, inclusion in the gallery respect, you've partnered with for the, meta, uh, for the meta, excuse me, for the metaverse domain. You guys have various stories and conversations of civil rights activists, Tulsa massacre, and Holocaust survivors, and conversations with actors and, and celebrities. What is the goal that StoryFile wants to achieve by being present in the metaverse? And how can your solution be integrated into other um, metaverse engines? Yes. Well, thanks for that question. Um, I mean, the to, to me, I mean, the, the goal of the metaverse is really connecting people. It's like we can we can all, we can all be here in this space together, connecting in, in ways that we wouldn't otherwise. Um, but I mean, also my hope is that we don't spend all our time in the metaverse. Like we, we need to go out into the real world. So in a way, what I feel like we're doing in the metaverse is to allow people to even connect even when they're not present. So if you go to the Respect Gallery, you can have a conversation with yeah, the 107-year-old Tulsa massacre survivor. She is not going to be spending all her time in the metaverse. Um, I can pretty much guarantee that, but you can go there and you can have a conversation with her any time of day, um, hopefully for years. Um, and I think that 
is sort of how I view the metaverse as a way of like you connecting and spreading your message. So, I mean, going back to what Marion was saying, like, yeah, we were saying like lots of entrepreneurs, you assume they're white and they're male and they're there. So one of the, uh, the next projects we're trying to do with Eve is to actually capture story files for uh, entrepreneur leaders from minority communities. So that if you do it, you could do your digital pitch in the metaverse and people could come up and ask you questions about like that. that if you ever started a company, there's like 20 questions that you're going to get a day again, every, every day from like all the different investors. But like having that be out there as an interactive um, sort of video that you can put in the metaverse in the gal in a gallery for your company or on your LinkedIn profile. Um, I mean, it, the metaverse is just like one just extra avenue or platform where you can spread your message out there. Um, the challenge right now, now really is that it's kind of a it's, a it's a wild west of metaverses. So like trying to add new technology into spatial or uh, all these other platforms that are coming out. I mean. Some of them are based on common platforms like Unity and Unreal, but even then they're really, they're all sort of, most of them are closed platforms. So we sort of have to approach each one individually and say, like, how do we get our technology in there? Uh, and we're starting to have those conversations, but um, it's sort of, I mean, it's exciting, but it's also really frustrating because it sometimes feels like we're stuck in like the sort of the second life world of the metaverse from like 10 years ago. And I, I, we really should be like pushing that technology forward and like, making more interactive and engaging experiences. Thank you so much for that. And uh, I just have one last uh, question. Well, it's three in one, actually. You all have been so generous of your time and your expertise, and I've learned so much about your work and your research. <clears throat> Excuse me. But for my last three-part question, are there any thoughts on the state of the metaverse in 20? And you all can take either one of these or all of them. Um, and can we figure out a way and build that by then so that our integrated world welcomes everyone um, and they can feel 100% safe? And then the third part of it is, is there something that we didn't cover that is absolutely important for you to share with this audience? So, um, Marion, why don't we start with you? Well, one thing I've learned is um, we have no clue what it's going to look like in a bunch of years. I remember um, when mobile phones came on uh, at, at first, um, there was this, doc this guy here in the Netherlands who filmed people on the streets uh, talking about, you know, would you ever use a mobile phone? And they were like, are you nuts? You know, why would you do that? And they were, on your bike? Are you kidding me? Nah, never. You know, five years later, we can't do without them and we live on them fully. Um, so with regards to the metaphors, I don't think I can imagine what it will look like. It's going to be completely different than I will expect right now, because there are going to be opportunities on the technological uh, uh, way, uh, on, the, on the technological um, front that are, are, are that I'm not aware of that, are, that I can do. Because uh, I feel a bit like, uh, was it Henry Ford said, you know, if I ask people what they, are, they want, they want a faster horse. Uh, and we're building uh, cars, but really, you know, we want to create mobility to get from A to B. It is that kind of thing, um, I think, for the metaphors as well. So, um, and I can't think of anything that is missed that I've missed, uh, I haven't or haven't said right now. So, um, except for it's it's awesome, and I feel so privileged being on the stage with you people, and it's been so inspiring um, to to listen and to be part of this. Thank you, Valerie. Been over to you. Any thoughts on the metaverse in 2030? How we can make sure it's integrated so that everyone feels safe? And is there anything that we didn't cover? That I think is absolutely to share. Great question. I mean, I think like if we if go ahead five, ten years, I and mean, I think metaverse is going to look really different. I think the ability of people to author content and create content is going to really change. I mean, as neural networks are allowing people to synthesize and create artwork, create all sorts of new media. And I think a lot of that's gonna be on display in the metaverse. Um, I also think like we're gonna have a revolution in, I mean, display technology over the next five, 10 years. Like we act, I mean, we keep saying AR and VR are gonna come and they keep coming and then they're not quite ready yet. But I mean, really the only way that's gonna take off is when you actually have an AR and a VR headset that's like the size of wearing a pair of sunglasses. And I think we're just starting to see the technology coming out with micro LEDs and other really tiny pixels where we can start creating these really small displays that 
will look will be convenient i mean the question is like will they be accessible well, probably not i mean how, how do we make those cheap enough and widely available that it's not just like an elite place where people who can afford the best display can access these spaces and experience them fully um i think the one thing that we are going to have to be struggling with and that's never going to go away is that i mean metaverse is an online platform and i mean as we've seen in on facebook and other social media online forums tend to amplify like both our best but also like our worst instincts like people feel free to act like just terrible people, or they can act and be like really reach out and connect and you can build these connections. So we really just need to lean into that side of the metaverse, which is allowing people to build communities and build trust. And I think that's everything that we can do over the next five, 10 years to really build those connections. Like if you, if you feel like you're connected with someone, if someone's actually your friend, you're not gonna act like an online troll. It's, it's, it's when you feel anonymous, that's when people start acting having these worst imp impulses where they feel like they, they can hide behind their screen. Um, the other part is like, how do we moderate all of this? Um, and how do we combine both AI algorithms that can flag problematic content, but then also keeping the human in the loop because the AI is biased. So you have to have the human there helping moderating these platforms to make them really safe. So thank you. Thank you so much. And Kelly, your thoughts? on a virtual world that welcomes everyone and anything that you think we might have missed? And what do you think the state of the metaverse will look like in 2020? I'm really excited about the metaverse. Um, I'm probably in the minority here, but I find it just so exciting because I've waited for it for so long. When I was creating games such as Tomb Raider, I was living the environment that I was building. So being able to buy an apartment in Lara Croft's residence, that's the future for me. Um, that's my tribe. They're my people. They're the, the folks that I want to be with. And if I change my mind, I've got the opportunity to go to other worlds and visit other places, like going on holiday without ever leaving my screen. But the important thing to remember about the metaverse is it's nothing without people. And most of the places that we're talking about right now, Decentraland, Sandbox, Avakin Life, et cetera, their daily active user base, as well as places like Roblox, are very low because people are pretty afraid about being their true selves in that space or not being their true selves. However it is that they want to approach the metaverse is entirely up to them. And I think we've got to take the reins off a little bit to pull the reins back in. We don't know how people are gonna behave in the metaverse and we shouldn't really prepare to fail. We should prepare to succeed. And as Valerie said, you know, be the best version of yourself in there. Look for your friends. Don't look for people that you can hate on or don't go around being anonymous. We also have to trust ourselves and that will enable us to moderate ourselves better. And remember that the metaverse is mobile. So where we've got our mobile phones, our cell phones, our Nintendo switches, et cetera, we're on the move. That gives us a good opportunity to be more interoperable. And in everything that we purchase, we've got too much stuff already, I know. Let's try and be mindful about not just landfill waste, but also digital sustainability. When we're done with something, let's give that something, that service base, those bytes back to the people who are creating and doing stuff. And I think that's a really great way for us to be able to move forward in the metaverse. And I can't wait to buy my apartment in Tomb Raider. Super exciting. I love it. I want to thank you all so much for participating here today. You all have inspired me greatly. And in my own work for the past five years in the AI ethics space, I started really, really trying to understand algorithmic bias and it evolved to more responsible AI, where I get the opportunity to spend time with executives of, of different companies.
companies trying to understand what their decision making is around inclusive design, around inclusive thinking, around stakeholder engagement. Who do you have at the table? Whose voice is important and why? And so all of you have inspired me to continue my work and to continue um, moving forward. And I'm sure you've inspired this audience. Can we give them another round of applause today? Thank you so much. I am going to turn it over to Eve. Eve, should we um, come down and let you do the stage? No, you can stay there. I'm appearing in my bubble here because I want to also uh, use my hands to clap for you, not only the C button on the keyboard. It was one of the best books I personally ever heard on inclusive and accessible design, solutions, products, metaverse spaces, name it. It is a framework that any company, any founder, any creative gang of people can just write down and make sure that they build with this framework uh, in mind. Thank you so, so much for bringing all these uh, insights on the creation of inclusive and accessible spaces. I think the future is metaversal enough multiversal, omniversal, just figure out how you want to call it, but it's a virtual environment that brings people like us together to learn from one another, to create amazing new solutions to make our lives and the planet better. So we are to discuss many topics. Um, this decentralized series, we just started with them, right? It's our fourth episode and we'll be rock and roll until the end of the year and then to infinity and beyond, I hope. Maybe in the next times we'll uh, see other platforms, but closing this event in this wonderful space of Spatial that is a partner of Evenus, um, they provide this environment for us to organize an event. I would like to ask you to also clap for this opportunity um, to, to get together with people. And, yeah, exactly that. Uh, what I'm doing at this moment, I'm changing the banner behind all of you to to announce our next event that will be happening on June 2nd and it's in progress one two three four five is up here there we go the crypto economy and decentralized finance on June 2nd you see the lineup of speakers it is well what uh, English people say flabbergasting right it's uh, super exciting so Dr. Martin Key's book, who is head of blockchain and crypto research at Uphold, will be the keynote speaker. We have Jakob Bursma from the Netherlands, who is CryptoCast podcast uh, um, co-host on BNR News Radio, moderating the discussion. And then we have uh, the panelists, Tavonia Evans, the founder of Guapcoin. It's a, a, a coin a token for the... Uh, uh, cultural, let's say, engagements, so for the people of color, for the underrepresented and represented communities. Um, Elchin Bayramov, decentralized uh, CFO uh, of SWAP, um, Habio ID, and, and Mark Taverner, who you may have heard of if you're based in Europe, uh, because he is executive director of Enadpa, which is a huge association of blockchain. Um, uh, covering the whole Europe. So that's going to be another mind-blowing event. Don't miss it. And closing up this event, I would like to change the banner back and give the opportunity for the attendees to ask their questions. We'll take three questions and then we'll just rock and roll with networking until, uh, well, the, for, the, for the next 30 minutes. Everyone is different time zones. Okay, do we have any questions in the audience? Use the opportunity. You can also, if you're not attending, uh, write in comments. We're live streaming on YouTube. We're live streaming on LinkedIn. Uh, also, I believe, on Twitter. So we can also come back to your questions later. But uh, do we have any question right now before we start practicing four, five, and six keys, uh, three keys on the keyboard? Come on. Use the moment. Uh, the opportunity. Eve, I have one question. Okay. And this is a general, 
next question in this particular space. Is there a space here where you can go and have a private conversation for networking? Uh, well, it is a great question. Uh, there is not a space in, on this platform, but by the magic of teleportation, I am to enable it with the little uh, portal that will take you to another space where you can host a private discussion. So there you go. That will be a quick get together for uh, private discussion. That's awesome. Thank you. That's that's actually cool that you can teleport yourself that way. <laughs> so that, that's fantastic. Yeah, just uh, if we need more um, port, uh, well, teleportation options or spaces, it's uh, very easy to add. And in the end of the room, there are two uh, portals to lead you to the Women in AI gallery that was organized and launched together with Shutterstock and the gallery respect that was mentioned today. Uh, the gallery showcases the stories uh, of color, uh, people of color on the global scale and through history. It's uh, worthwhile not just attending to talk to your peers, but to actually learn from the stories. And there are story files. That's uh, the gallery where you can also scan the QR code and ask questions to people in the video who will respond back with their stories. Something incredible to experience. I do have a question for Elizabeth, because you've been hosting this mm -hmm. panel now today uh, and um, you've, you've done a fantastic job. The only thing that I miss is that I would have loved to also hear your perspective on on the questions you've asked us. Is there anything um, that you asked us that you thought, oh, I would I would love to also um, share your own uh, vision on um, you know, with your background in, in the AI ethics point of view? Wow, great question. Thank you for asking me. Um, I think you guys did a really good job. I, I think mostly about inclusion and accessibility as well. I think about the private spaces, which is the reason why I asked Eve if there was a space to go. I'm still trying to understand all of this, um, to be perfectly honest. Uh, Eve and I, Eve has spent some time with me helping me navigate the metaverse. I actually think it's very, very cool. I think it's uh, something that young people will get excited about. I actually think that this is where people who might be a bit introverted might have a place here to connect with others. Because that's my whole thing is how do we find joy in technology? And how and is the metaverse that space? And can we put the right uh, safeguards or guardrails in place so that people can find joy in the metaverse, no matter where they come from or who they are? And I've said this before in some of my speeches that I want to wake up and not have to fight systems that were designed to keep me out. And so, and that being because of either my gender or the color of my skin or some other type of way that I'm excluded in everyday life. And so if the metaverse is that place for where I can find that tribe, great. But I know that there's a lot of work that has to be done here. So super, super excited to hear all of the different ways that you all are partnering with your organizations and globally. Um, to make sure that it is, it is accessible and it is safe and it is uh, trustworthy. Whoa, that was the longest clap I ever heard, but it was worth it because the answer was epic. Thank you, thank you so very much, everyone. I think we will start the networking time. Please do feel free to explore various galleries and spaces and also talk to one another. That's the point of the networking part. Um, the gallery, or well, the gallery, the, the virtual venue is open uh, for the next 30 minutes. We'll have some music playing in the background. And once again, dear speakers, Thank you for sharing today with us your valuable knowledge, uh, your expertise, and your thoughts about the future, how we can build and create better, more inclusive, and with accessibility in mind. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, everyone.